all this will be on video, so if your friends and whatever say, you know, uh, we didn't make it and things like that, just tell them. They can go on and watch it. Um, it's on there. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for another good day of life. And we pray that uh, the information we have uh, in, for, in front of us today will be helpful. And it will help us to uh, gain insight into who Christ really is and what this means for our life. We thank you for the uh, sermon today that, uh, uh, that Randy brought and the information that he shared with us. And we just pray that uh, we think about this during this special season of Easter and that uh, we look to Christ for the answers to the issues of our families and uh, with our life. Thank you, Lord, for everything that you're doing. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. First thing I want to do is um, I want to tell you about homework-wise. The homework that we had for today, we're going to postpone till next week. And the reason we're going to do that is that we have three things we want to cover today Two that weeks. are very important. It's yes? Easter next mm -hmm. week. What, what is? Easter next week. So Easter, no, no, yes, thank you. Yeah, not in two weeks. It'll be two weeks. So uh, that gives you two weeks <laughs> uh, to finish that, that little uh, uh, section that we're doing homework, okay? Um, so uh, what I wanted to do is I wanted to pick up where we left off uh, with Lazarus and uh, just finish a few notes on Lazarus and then um, we'll. Um, jump right into the discourse with Nicodemus, and then compare that to the woman at the well, okay? I think I need to turn this way so I can see her. There you go. <laughs> All right. Okay, let's, uh, let's, let's go back. If you can remember, uh, find it, go, go to your Bibles and look up John 11. John 11 is the, um, and we're going to start with verse 21 of John 11. 1121? 1121, that's correct. And uh, this is where uh, Martha, if you recall the story, just a quick background, uh, Jesus is in the Transjordan. He's there with his disciples. They are ministering. They're having a wonderful time. A lot of good things are happening. Uh, and uh, he gets a message from Martha. Come quickly. Uh, your, your friend, uh, Lazarus, is uh, sick, and he really needs you. So please come quickly, and, and uh, as fast as you can, uh, he's, he's not doing well. Jesus gets the message and decides to stay two more days. And uh, as you recall the conversation between him and his disciples, he gets up after two days, and and uh, says to them, uh, come on, we're going to go back to, uh, to Judea. And, he's, and they're looking at each other like, what? Why do you want to go back there? We're going to get, you know, they want to stone you. They want to kill you. Why do you want to go there? And uh, so, yes, they want to stone us. Yes, they want to kill us. But, but uh, Lazarus um, is asleep, and we need to go wake him up. <laughs> That's what he said to them. And so one of the disciples grabs him and shakes him and says, well, look, hey, hey Jesus, if, if, he's, if he's asleep, he'll wake up. It, it, he'll be okay. And Jesus just, okay, let me try this again. Lazarus is dead, and we need to go and take care of that situation. Come with me. So Thomas, being a man of, 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 of great faith and everything, <laughs> says to all the disciples, come on, let's go with Jesus. Let's go back there and die with him. You know, miss the whole point, you know, of what's going on. But basically, that's, that's the background. And then Jesus arrives. By the time he gets there, Lazarus has been in the tomb, in the tomb, four days. Okay? So now we know Lazarus is truly dead. And it, it, there's an odor coming from it, which we find out from Martha later when he tries to raise us. So I want you to hear this conversation between Martha and Mary so that you get what John is really trying to tell us, the message that John is trying to say in his gospel. And here it is. It says, 
in uh, John, I'm going to, I'm just going to tell you the verses where I'm taking some of the information. It's John 11, 21 through 22. And uh, this is Martha speaking. Uh, Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now this statement makes Jesus uh, actually nothing more than a prophet. And you'll see why as we go on here. And, and it actually, it kind of negates the new, new covenant altogether. Everything you and I know about this new covenant with Jesus, he is the new covenant. And, and, and this negates all of that. So, it really says, this is not a criticism or a complaint, as I see it, but it demonstrates her faith that Jesus has the power to heal. There's absolutely no doubt about that. She believes that. And even though the, situa the situation has escalated to his death, uh, the death of Lazarus, she still believes if he asks the Father, he will give him whatever he wants. This is interesting. Listen to this. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Interesting question. Now listen carefully to Jesus' answer. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. That's all he said. Your brother will rise again. Here's Martha. I know he will rise again in the resurrection. And of course, Jesus and the Pharisees in those days believed in the resurrection. At the last day, but Jesus said to her, listen to this, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? And she said, yes. <laughs> yes, kind of hesitantly, you know. All right. Here's what we have. God is not going to come someday, according to Jesus, and make everything all right. The shepherd has already arrived. He is already here. He's here now. He's going to wipe the tears. He's going to make the resurrection possible now. And she knows that those in the tomb uh, will hear his voice and, and raise from the dead in, in 525. Uh, that, that's very clear. And then John tries to communicate that right now, if you believe, you will have eternal life right now, and you will be regenerated, justified, and sanctified. Your life now is about dying to live, and that makes you face-to-face -face with Jesus, who is the resurrection and the life, and who is the new covenant. Everyone else is living some day to die. Now, what's significant about that, that conversation? First of all, what happens is she tries to convince Jesus. She's very persistent. She wants her brother back. <laughs> and she's very consistent. And she lets him know that she knows who he is. What she misses is what? What did she miss? Can you imagine saying to God, if you would just talk to your father, Daddy would give you whatever you want, and you could help my brother. Think about that. <laughs> She's forgotten who she's talking to. Okay? And this becomes, it, it multiplies. She's had these conversations in her home with other people and with the people who came to, to, to uh, console her and also with her sister. Listen to this. Look at 11, 28 through 37. I'm going to take something out of 1132 right now. What about Mary? When Mary reaches the place where Jesus was, Martha, remember, ran out to meet him. Then she went back and got married and said that Master would like to talk to you. When she reached that place, she fell at his feet and said, you know, you don't believe this, ready? Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. I could just hear Jesus go, uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> now remember, Jesus had already made up his mind. In the Transjordan, he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. So, so this is interesting. When Jesus saw her weeping, and this, there's so much misinterpretation about this. When Jesus saw her weeping 
And the Jews that were with them, remember I told you all the Jews were there? Plus, not only to visit them, but they were all passing through Bethany on their way to Jerusalem for the big festival. And so there were a lot, many more Jews and people there um, that, that ended up witnessing all of this. The Jews had come along with her also weeping. And listen to what the scripture says. He was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. I've heard the strangest things about that information. You know, Jesus was really upset that, uh, that Lazarus died. Jesus wept over the fact that, that Lazarus was dead. And now he'd have to talk to his father and see if he could raise him or whatever. You know, all that is wrong. That's wrong. That's not what's happening here at all. Watch. The word troubled, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. You look up that word. Here it means agitated or troubled of mind. These are parallel Old Testament like Jeremiah 13, 17. Jeremiah was known as what? The weeping prophet, right? Here, listen. If you do not listen, I will weep in secret because of your pride. My eyes will weep bitterly, overflowing with tears, because the Lord's flock will be taken captive. Ah, your first hint from the Old Testament. The Lord's flock is being taken captive. Martha and Mary are certainly part of the Lord's flock. Okay? The influence of the use of these words here indicates deeply moved in spirit and at the same time troubling for Jesus because he sees that evil has been able to do his flock harm. They have been taken captive by Satan and Exodus tells us that God is a jealous God. Remember? He's a jealous God. But no matter what Jesus does, they will not trust him. They don't listen to him carefully, and they don't trust him. You belong to your father, Jesus said in John 8, 44. Remember this? The devil. And you want to carry your father's, out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. What's the secret here? What Have you ever asked yourself, what would make God weep? What would make God sad? Why would he shed tears? Is he going to shed tears because a human being dies? I don't think so. <laughs> no, no. That, that's victory. That's victory. He's not going to shed a tear over that. Okay, so what we have here is in John eleven thirty three, 33, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her so also weeping, he, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Listen to Genesis 5 and 7. Sounds like familiar language. Go back to the Old Testament. Listen to this. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on earth. And that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts, human hearts, was all evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he made human beings on earth and his heart was deeply troubled. There it is. Here is the word troubled again. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth all of the human race that I created. And within the animals and the birds and the creatures that moved along the ground. For I regret that I have made them. And listen to John 8, 51. Very truly I tell you, whoever obeys my word will never see. Whoever obeys my word will never see death. This is clear. This is clear. And in 8, 44, you belong to your father the devil, like we said before. Then we get to the raising of Lazarus. Now, uh, I, hope that's, I hope that gives you some insight as to where Jesus is coming from. 
And once again, he's going to go out and he's going to, to raise Lazarus from the dead, but he is going to have a conversation with his father. He is going to have a prayer, and he's going to do it publicly. And he's going to tell you in the prayer, I'm not doing this for me. I know you hear me all the time. We talk every day, every minute of, of, of life. The reason that I'm saying this is so that these people behind me will hear this, and they will know that you and I are one. <coughs> this is his prayer before he raises. James, you asked the question, what makes God weep? Is it just unbelief? It's, we never answered the question, but is that what we're Okay, at? I thought the scripture did. Uh, yeah. That's a good question. Let's just make it that's clear. a good question. What makes him weep is the sadness knowing that we haven't figured out who he is. We just, we, we, we don't know who Jesus really is. We, we, we treat him like uh, this, uh, John uses the word son of man because he's born into the flesh. The scriptures use the word son of God because he's the only begotten son of God. But when we talk to Jesus, it's all about, here, here they're coming with their selfish little ambition. You know, I want my brother back. <laughs> and if you just asked your father, I, he would probably say yes to you. Just think of that. That, that would make anybody troubled. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, another way that I was like kind of seeing it, which I'm not sure, or I would like your input on, would be like the fact that like Jesus is sympathizing with us and other things because he knows like how we're tempted and so like in terms of whether or not he felt their pain and was weeping with them would you say that, that was I would say he's not weeping with them but the first part was good better than what I said uh, the, 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 the sympathy that he has the love that he has for them is so disappointing it's not like his father early on in Genesis. He, he just, he can't believe that he's been with this family. He knows this family really well. They know him. He loves them. He cares for them. And yet there's a whole bunch of Jews, and they're all weeping and crying like something terrible has happened. And here's something that, that you don't even probably think about. Lazarus was already in the kingdom. Lazarus accepted Jesus for who he was. Not only were they good friends, but he, he saw him as a savior. He worshiped Jesus. Now he dies. Now what happens? The guy dies. Jesus raises him from the dead. I don't know what that's like to be raised a couple times. That's going to be interesting. I'm going to talk to him when I get there. i <laughs> find out where that fell. Uh, but, but, but anyway, the interesting thing is, is that, that Jesus is looking at him and he's saying, he, he's saying, you know, I am the resurrection and the life. So raising Lazarus, even though you think he's dead in the grave, he's already risen. He's already in the kingdom. He's with me. So all I'm going to do is stand up here and say, Lazarus, come out. He's going to call him. He belongs to him. He already belongs to him. So it's interesting. I think what you said is has merit, though. I think I think he has some sense of sympathy, but I think his his weeping was not for the death of Lazarus. It was because he sees how evil has been able to influence his closest friends and his people and the Jews, how they just don't get it. And 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 that's the same thing that happened at creation. Well, the raising of Lazarus in front of all the witnesses demonstrates that Jesus is the Christ and the sovereign control over death and life. And this is the last sign that John records, as you well know. And uh, uh, hundreds of people saw it. John believed. And this was uh, far, a far greatest display of supernatural power than anything else that he had done. And John's purpose was very clear here, that you might believe. Jesus did not give life he is life. There's a difference? Mm -hmm. He doesn't give it. He is life. And later on, he's on one of his I am statements that you probably read, he said what? I am the way, the truth, and life. You got it. There it is. If you want to know the way, he's the way. If you want to know the truth, he is the truth. Pilate, Randy said this morning, 
Powell said, uh, boy, it'd be good to, it would really be neat to know uh, what his attitude was when he said to Jesus, uh, what is truth? You know, what kind of attitude did he have about that? Or did he say, oh, really interesting, what is truth? You know, or what, how did he really approach that? Jesus is truth. Truth, my friends, is a person. It's not a philosophy from the Greek days. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Jesus is all those things and more. And that's the message John tries to get to us. And, and the synoptics don't quite always bring that out. But John really gets behind it and pushes it so that we get it clear and we understand it. So, uh, basically, in 1145 through 57, Here's a reaction to the resurrection. There's major results. God's glory is seen in Jesus. Two, some people experiencing faith were born again. Others were not. Some believed, some did not. The Pharisees' reaction, this was interesting, and you know where this is leading up to? The Palm Sunday today. This is leading up to Palm Sunday today. This is exactly what's going to happen. He's going to go in a few days into Jerusalem, ride on the donkey, come through town, they're going to throw the palm the leaves down, and, and all the rest of it. And basically, this is what the Pharisees are going to say. As Jesus comes into Jerusalem, the Pharisees say, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. They're not jealous or anything. <laughs> After raising Lazarus, the Pharisees proclaimed in John 11, 48, listen, if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. Wow. Wow. 11, 37 through 43. Somebody read that. A couple verses here. John 11, 37 through 43. But some, but some of them said, Could not he who, who opened the eyes of the blind men also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came from the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the, the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be... There will be an odor, for he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound in linen strips, and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Good, thank you. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Now you got the whole picture. Remember the cosmic battle with the kingdom of God. This is what's going on here. This is a battle between the kingdom of, 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 of evil and the kingdom of God. And... Um, Jesus helped us to see the separation, how to separate this out, and called for those uh, who uh, saw to believe. And, and the resurrection becomes the core of the gospel. I'll say that, I don't want to make that too superfluous. The, the resurrection is the core of the gospel. Okay? Remember that. Because we haven't talked about the resurrection yet. I mean, we, we kind of did here. But we're going to miss Easter, and then we're going to come back, and we're going to have a couple other sessions. Then we are going to talk about resurrection. I wonder why I did it like that. There's a reason for that. Because resurrection is who you are. If you're willing to tell me this morning, you have given your life to Christ, you follow him as your Savior, you have already been raised from the dead. See? <laughs> when you open your eyes, you're going to see Jesus. You don't want to open your eyes 
and see a big white throne. Trust me, you don't want to be there. You just want to see his face. And that's the difference. That's who you are. John wants you to know who you are. Very important. All right, pull out your chart. <laughs> chart. chart for overview of Gospel John. Now what we're going to do is we're going to move from Lazarus. Any questions about Lazarus? We're about to start Nicodemus. 3, 1 through 21. This is a fun thing. Now here's what I did for you. I took chapter 3, verse 1 through 21. Now there's more to that chapter. But I'm just going to discuss with you and kind of share with you insights that I pick up as, as I read this with regard to Nicodemus, that discourse. So you want to take it, whatever good notes that you can take because this will be very helpful. Unfortunately, I don't have a, a handout on this. Um, however, I did make you a handout on the next one, which is I'm going to contrast this with the woman at the well and Jesus' discourse with her. And you'll see the significant differences and I made you a chart where you can actually see what Jesus said, what she said, what he said, what she said, what he said, you know, so that you get the flow of how it worked and how he talked with this woman. So where are we? We are right here. Three and four. Jesus, during this new covenant, revealing himself and the first big conversation in his public ministry, this first big discourse comes with Nicodemus. And here's what happens. Let me give you this much introduction. He was a member of a Jewish ruling council. He was very influential. It was made up of Sadducees and Pharisees, the very elite people of religion. But they were under Roman rule. And I think nobody... Nobody laid that out better for you than Randy did this morning, if you heard that. They're under Roman rule. And the Romans had to be able to approve some of the things that the Jews wanted to do. So Nicodemus was a Pharisee, uh, part of a group of alerted individuals who were known for being pious, very disciplined, highly intelligent, and uh, conservative. However, Nicodemus was one step higher. He was a professor of divinity. Okay? Let me tell you what that means. Which means he was a teacher with credentials, able to teach the Jewish people because he had memorized the entire Old Testament. How did they remember it? Now, now, now listen to this. The writings, the prophets, and the entire Torah, the Pentateuch, the first five books, to memory. And on top of that, he had memorized all the oral tradition. And uh, I don't know what kind of genius that is, but that's a pretty brilliant guy. <laughs> I can do something like that and be able to discuss it and understood it and was a teacher of Israel. So. Verse 2. You can follow me along here. I'll give you the verses as I go. Verse 2. Yes. How, how do you derive all that? Is there secondary sources that talk about oh, these oh, credentials oh, 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 here? Yeah. Or is there a term in, in the scripture that... Yes. 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 Plus the fact, plus the fact <laughs> that, that uh, when you look up his name, uh, even in commentaries, anything, they will give you all that background and show you how he kind of stands out. Matter of fact, the I think... In some of the conversations I get from, from Pharisees, which you'll see later, they're a little jealous of him. They, you know, because he, he uh, uh, they, they chide him a lot, you know, and, and that kind of stuff. So that stands out. But, and, and also, um, you'll see what he does with that as he talks to Jesus. He comes by night to visit with Jesus. This is in verse 2. Uh, his speculation, uh, all kinds of speculation on what that meant, but knowing John, and knowing John's detail, remember how detailed John is about every little thing? Okay. 
night means something, just like light means something. So if he comes at night, bingo, something should go on in your brain that says, it's not that he's just trying to avoid the public. Let me tell you, a man like that doesn't, he does not say, oh, well, I don't want to talk to this Jesus in public. It might be misinterpreted. No. Are you kidding me? This guy's got it together. You know, he's not going to worry about if it's okay to talk to him in public. Now, there were some administrative people and some Pharisees that did believe some of the things that Jesus was doing, and, and they were in fear of being thrown out of the temple, just like the blind man, okay? So what they did is they kind of pulled back. So maybe Nicodemus did say, okay, I'll sneak over there at night, but I'm going to have a conversation with this guy. We're going to talk. I want him to tell me something I don't know. <laughs> So, you know, because I know pretty much everything there is to know, okay? And I teach the others. So this is what happens. Wait, can you go back? What does the night, what are you saying the night implies in this situation? The, the night in John always, always implies uh, darkness. It, it, it implies um, evil. It implies uh, something that is done sinister. Uh, it, it implies not being in the light. Being in the light is seeking to see Jesus. Anything else is not what, what John will call later is not the gospel. So anything done at night in that kind of environment, John does this. Let me show you a simple example. When, when uh, for example, they were in the upper room, uh, Jesus points out who who is going to betray him, uh, and he picks up, Judas picks up all his stuff, takes the money bag, gets up, and walks out. And how does John report that? Judas left, and it was night. night. See? There's lots of like, little things. He slides in. You know? Yeah. So, in terms of his literary style, even though factually, if all those things happened at night, he simply would have omitted that detail if he wasn't trying to make that emphasis and connection more thematic. That's correct. That's correct. Yeah. That's a good, very good assumption. Yeah. At least from the best scholars I read and the commentaries I read, uh, they all agree that so that's what it's for. So, the speculation here is John is detailed individual. One of these themes is light and darkness, and, and uh, I want you to see that. Nicodemus doesn't want to come publicly during the day. I disagree with that. I just don't think that makes sense. He's too smart for that. Um, there's another motive. In 750, uh, if you have your Bible, uh, turn to uh, chapter 7, uh, verse 50. Five, six, seven. Verse 50. When I saw this, I thought, this is interesting. Listen to this. You were asking about this. This may be helpful. Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier, and who was one of their own number, asked. Now, he's talking to the Pharisees, his own bunch of people. Does our law condemn anyone without first hearing him to find out what he's doing? Huh? Interesting. What did they reply to it? Remember how I said they chide him now and then? Here's what they did. Are you from Galilee too? That was kind of a little smear, you know. Are you from Galilee too? You know? Look into it, and you will find that a prophet does not come out of Galilee. And you know what? They're absolutely right about that. It's just that they didn't know that he was born in Bethlehem of Judea. Okay? They, they go right to his family because of the census. And they see that he is registered and is growing up in Nazareth in Galilee. So that's the difference. So this is the kind of stuff that goes on. Um, I'll try to move a little quicker. <laughs> Nicodemus begins conversation in verse 2b, and Nicodemus uses the word, we know. So you've got to catch this little stuff. This is interesting. We know. We know. It's kind of a, it's, I don't know how else to describe this, but it's kind of like a pompous pride, kind of a little bit of a pride. 
and brokenness of this religion that's going to talk to God? Okay, he's coming over to talk to God, okay? And he prefaces it with rabbi. Now, I want to give him credit here. Rabbi. Rabbi, this is a gesture of respect indicating that Jesus is a teacher, at least at Nicodemus's level, okay? And above. That's a respectful thing. But I don't believe it was sincere. Because that kind of unfolds, and it doesn't look as respectful later. He didn't refer to him as a faith healer, which is right. He didn't say, hey, you were a revolutionary nut, you know, we want to talk to you, or, or something like that. Uh, or someone who taught questionable things, but focused immediately on the fact that Jesus came from God and performed miraculous signs that couldn't be done without God. Very interesting. Very interesting. Okay, listen to this. The encounter between Jesus and Nicodemus in large part, conflicts, or shows and points out the conflict between Jesus and the religious authorities. It's just another conversation about these conflicts. Watch what happens with the religious authorities. Make no mistake, this is a challenge, and I want you to hear that. Nicodemus did not come, he came to come, he came to be polite, but to put this guy in his place. Okay? It'll be interesting to see how he leaves. <laughs> All right? So, anyway, this is what happens. The word we is very interesting. I, I look at every little thing. Who is the we? <laughs> he doesn't say. Does he have a group of people that are just studying Jesus or investigating him? Or is it all the Pharisees? I, I, I don't think so. Some Pharisees and others believe Jesus had um, right to clear, clear the temple and all the things that he had done, and some believe, and, but they weren't going to say anything about it. They kept it quiet. Perhaps he met a group of us watching you and some that were just, you know, observing what he does, perhaps. But Nicodemus embodies a broken religion and a broken humanity. Think about this. Everything John has taught us to this point, we know that we're in a new covenant, aren't we? Right? We're not in the old covenant. What was wrong with the old covenant? And what is the old covenant? You need to be able to answer that question now. What is the old covenant? The Davidic covenant? Mosaic. The Abraham? The Mosaic. That's correct. <laughs> Not fair, she knows my so. <laughs> okay, it is the Mosaic Covenant. Okay, the Mosaic Covenant is null and void. Go ahead. Oh, no, 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 no. All right, so it is null and void. So that's that's what's involved here. So what we have here is the word we is interesting. Uh, perhaps he meant all these other kinds of things, but Nicodemus embodies this broken religion, this void religion, okay, and a broken kind of humanity because they're not getting it. They refuse to listen to what he says. He's going to bring that up to Nicodemus. I keep talking, and you keep not listening. What's up? Okay. So that's where it involves. So Jesus' response to Nicodemus, as you will see in a few minutes, I'm going to trace, like I told you, what we did with the woman at the well in contrast to this situation right here. I'm going to trace that. And you'll see that what happened with the woman on the well, with, uh, at the well, it was easy to figure out what Jesus said, what she said, what Jesus said, what she said. You're never going to figure this one out. <laughs> where, where do you, where do you live? He, Nicodemus implies questions to Jesus. Implies them. Okay? Jesus never answers them. He tells Nicodemus something else. You want to go nuts, turn to follow a conversation? Try that one. It just, you know, I had to read this, I don't know how many times, until I could figure out what's going on here. So, here's what we have. Jesus responds to Nicodemus. As you will see, uh, it's very hard, like I said, to, to understand these conversations, but go, let's listen to verse 3. Jesus replied, Jesus came by night, uh oh, by the way, in verse 2, um, uh, did we read Nicodemus? Uh, we know, you know, that you're 
you, you, you were somebody, and obviously from God, because God, you couldn't do these, these things, these miracles and things, if it weren't for God being with you, right? Verse 3, Jesus replies, Very truly I say to you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Huh? <laughs> how, does, how does that work? How does that fit? Okay. Notice the concern and response doesn't match, right? But Jesus presses forward to the heart of the matter. And the reason I want to tell you this is, like I told you before, this is not a friendly conversation. Everybody has Nicodemus and Jesus having tea together and grumpies, you know, and having this nice little discussion. Uh-uh. This is probably on a balcony in somebody's home at nighttime. And Nicodemus is presenting himself, and Jesus is well aware of the intentions of his heart. Because he is God, and he knows. So, Merrill Tenney, remember one of the guys that I told you you could, uh, one of the books I referred to you? Merrill Tenney says this. But what Jesus responded was, Nicodemus, here is the challenge for you. Will you get into the kingdom? I think that's an interesting thing. Teddy followed through on what, what he actually asked and what Jesus answered. And Jesus brought the kingdom of God into the conversation. That wasn't something that Nicodemus did. But here's the beauty of this thing. Jesus went right for Nicodemus, all of his incorrect thinking. And he said, Jesus, the conversation is not about miracles, Nicodemus. It's not about miracles but rather how you are able to see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus sees supernatural events, and he chalks them up with all these other people, the we that he says are watching him, and, and chalks them all up to a man sent for a God. Well, the real issue is how do you, Nicodemus, get into the kingdom? Because right now, you cannot even see it unless you're born again. Now, that's pretty direct. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I'd be like witnessing to somebody and telling them, they say, you know, well, what do I have to do to be a Christian? Well, you need to confess that you're no good rotten sinner, and you, you know, I, I mean, he went right for the throat. He, he didn't, he didn't mince words with it. Verse 4, verse 4. How can someone be born when they're old? Now think about this. Nicodemus asked, Surely they cannot enter a second time into the mother's womb to be born. All the commentaries and some scholars believe that Jesus was using a metaphor regarding being born again. And Nicodemus was just responding to a physical metaphor. I believe Nicodemus was a very bright individual. <laughs> he knew a metaphor when he heard one. You know, he didn't need some help. You know, he knew what was going on. And Jesus was trying to make clear that we don't need more religious people, Nicodemus, like you and the Pharisees. What we need are new lives in the new covenant. We, need, we don't need more laws. We need more grace. We need love. And we need to live under a new covenant, not the laws of the old covenant. So Jesus further clarifies the issue, and it goes one more step. Verse 5a, the first part of 5. He added the word enter. This is fascinating. Because, and he defines it, he defines born again for Nicodemus. So he says, not only can't you see the kingdom, but you're, there's no way that you're ever going to enter the kingdom. Unless you're born again. Then he says, verily, truly, I tell you. No one will enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and spirit. Okay, here we go. Now he's adding two more things than he didn't have before in this conversation. You see how convoluted it's getting? It's getting really tough. And, and Nicodemus can follow, and he's sharp. He's, he, he's, he's not having a tough time. But he certainly has figured out that Jesus is no pushover. And that this guy knows what he's talking about, and he better listen. So I believe Nicodemus understood transformation. There's no doubt in my mind. 
that you had to be born of water and spirit, some kind of transformation. But for him, it was a mental attitude rather than a heart being transformed. And let me tell you, in the church today, that's what we have. We have a lot of people who have a mental transformation, conversion toward Jesus. But they have no idea what he's talking about. Their life shows them. So that's the difference. So I believe Nicodemus understood it. But if you assume you are chosen in the kingdom, like he did, the message of God's law can be reduced to improvements in behavior. That's what we call moralism. Remember? We talked about that. Good works. What did Randy end with today? I thought this was fascinating. I do not coordinate with these guys for each of you. I don't. It just happens. You know, it's the Holy Spirit working with all of us. And what did he end with today? You don't want to get caught up in good works. Remember? Isn't that fascinating? And this is exactly what Jesus is telling him. All right, what about water and spirit? What's that thing all about, water and spirit? Verse 5, B, the second part of 5. Water here does not mean baptism. I want to tell you that right away. Because everybody goes there. Okay, water all baptism. Jesus was talking about baptism. No, I wouldn't. Nor does it mean a foreknowledge of baptism that's going to come in the local church later. No, no, no. Just don't let that get into your mind. Okay? Jesus takes this concept right out of the Old Testament, right out of the Old Testament, in order to define born again for Nicodemus. And why do you think he would do that? Because he knew it backwards. <laughs> he knew the Old Testament backwards. Right, so he knew. He can't miss this one. I'm going to give him this one and see how he does. Okay? So here it is. Joel 2.28. And afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all the people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams, and your young men will see visions. There it is. Then, to add fire, a little more fuel to the fire, he went to Ezekiel 36, 25 through 28. Listen to this. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities inside and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart. This, and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from your heart the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Then you will live in the land I will give your ancestors and you will be my people and I will be your God. Amazing. Which verse is that? It's Ezekiel. 25. It's, uh, 25. Uh, yeah, 36, 25 through 28. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So the assumption is that Nicodemus knows and has memorized all these verses. And he knows exactly where Jesus is talking from, you know, and what he's saying. Okay? <clears throat> and he understands sprinkling, cleaning up, purification, and individuals have to be cleaned up because they're sinful in order for God to work with them through the Holy Spirit. Now, Nicodemus cannot imagine himself. This is amazing. This is just, this amazes me more than anything else. Religious folks, you know, especially this bunch, okay? He can't imagine himself in any kind of baptismal fount. Are you kidding me? I don't need cleaned up. Do you know who I am? Repenting or being cleansed. He completely missed the idea of transformation of the heart and the new covenant. And here's what he's missing. Regarding the spirit, off baptism now, regarding the spirit, Jesus isn't talking about the work of the Holy Spirit after his glorification. That's not what he's talking about here. He's asking Nicodemus to focus on God's nature as spirit, the pneuma in Greek, pneuma, spirit. God is spirit. Focus on the nature of God, Nicodemus. Once again, Nicodemus doesn't understand uh, the change on the inside. Nicodemus is a works man. Keep the law. Moses is our man. And do good works. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. That's not it. It's clean yourself up on the inside. 
The inside's what counts. Not how, how good your behavior is. We talked about that before. It's, it's, it's not who you are, Nicodemus, but it's who you are. So you said that <clears throat> when he's saying spirit, he's not trying to convey anything about that person in the Trinity. What's the distinction between those two? The distinction dots? is, and we haven't gotten to this yet because I haven't taught it yet uh, to you, but uh, <laughs> we can get there. We're going to get there. Yeah, we're going to get there, but I'll, I'll answer real quickly. Uh, in John, <clears throat> the Holy Spirit frequently is referred to, which you'll find in all of the teachings of Jesus when he gets uh, uh, past the upper room. Uh, as the, the word that's used is paraclete. Mm. That should tell you right there, not pneuma. Mm. So Both mean spirit, right? Okay. But that's the more generic. Two, di two different ways of looking at it, yeah. Uh, but here, regarding the spirit, Jesus is saying pneuma. Is it, you know, this, this is about understanding that it's God who does this transformation in your heart, Nicodemus. It's nothing you bring to the table, okay? That's, that's the key. John 3.16. Or 3.6. Flesh gives birth to flesh, he says. But the spirit gives birth to spirit. See? So he says to him, Jesus explains, flesh births flesh, and spirit births spirit. The flesh, at its best, produces more sinful people. <laughs> that's what we produce. We have more sinful people. The natural doesn't understand the supernatural. What I'm talking to you about is supernatural. It's how you're changed inside. Okay? But what about the spirit? In John 3, 8, the wind blows where it pleases. Wow, what insight. Jesus is really unfolding heavenly information for this guy, and he's missing it. Okay? The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear it sound, Nicodemus, but you cannot tell where it came or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. I can't tell by looking at you if you are born of the Spirit. I can't tell. But in a minute, Jesus is going to tell me how I know. Go ahead. So is this a... <laughs> Is this, is this Jesus acknowledging predestination? Predestination. I want to answer that carefully. That is a very good question. <laughs> the, the, the issue here is that, uh, let me say it this way. There is a sovereign sense that God knows and has foreknown those who will come to him and are given to him. But it does not exclude those who are interested in making that happen in their life. And what he is saying to Nicodemus, who thinks he's in, I'm in. I don't even know why we're talking about this. I'm in. Nicodemus, I'm the man. I'm in. And Jesus is saying, Let's take another look at that. You can't even see the kingdom, let alone enter. Okay? So in a sense, this is, a, I told you, this is a little combative. This is not a, a happy, over a cup of tea and cup. It's, this is, <laughs> they're going at each other here a little bit because Jesus, he repre Nicodemus represents everything Jesus has had conflict with from 11 forward. Everything. Here we go. In 3.7, or 3.6 uh, of the flesh, okay? 3.7, you should not be surprised at my <clears throat> saying this to you, Nicodemus. You must be born again. He doesn't want him surprised about, but what about the spirit? The wind blows where it may, like I said. <clears throat> Here Jesus emphasizes that the mechanics of being born again, now this is important. The mechanics of being born again are not readily available to mankind. Like I said, I cannot look at you and say, wow, spiritual person. <laughs> There's no way I can do that. Okay? But here's what 1 Corinthians 2.14 says. You might want to write that down. 1 Corinthians 2.14. 
the person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God. That's a pneuma. But considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. Here's another one right now. Romans 8, 11. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus, notice if, what does if mean? Is that one of those literary Condition. conditions? Conditional. Who said that? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Conditional. It means condition. Okay. If on the condition, the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because his spirit who lives in you. Interesting stuff. Now it gets more interesting. In most cases, listen to this. Conversion, and I find this every, everywhere I used to travel around the country and preach and, and teach, uh, it's always been fascinating to me uh, to hear people talk about their conversion. You know, their conversion to, oh, well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm born again, I'm saved. Okay. And I always like to hear about that. An interesting part, you know? Okay? In most cases, conversion is a change of mind. Okay? And something you can see. The effect, and sometimes you can't see the effect. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. No, if you are a Christian and claim to be born again, everything in your life is affected. Everything. Your job, what you're learning, your vocation, your profession, your life's goals, how you look for a mate, for all you young ones, <laughs> whatever, okay. How you look for me. Everything that you do, the language that comes out of your mouth. D.A. Carson, anybody know who Doc Carson is, Don? Okay, all right. Don Carson, I love this guy because he, he says things in, in funny ways, and I, I tend to get too professory, you know, because I'm used to doing that. And I try to look to him for some fun things to say. And uh, in describing this situation with. Uh, with Nicodemus, D.A. Carson says, with, with regard to conversion today and changing of the mind, the stuff that comes out of your mouth, the way you live life, the choices that you make, he says, says, your life must show a difference. And the difference has to be a lot bigger than your neighborhood pagan. Okay? Makes sense. If you and the pagan are both laughing at the same things, you need to question yourself. Being born again has visible effects on how you live your life. It is not simply a decision made by man, but a working of the Holy Spirit to regenerate your heart and transform your being. Who you are becomes whose you are, whose you are, who do you really belong to? I like to always tell girls in counsel, fall in love with Jesus, make him the first man in your life. Why? Because that will make all the difference in how they, they do life. That's why, okay? Being born again is visible. Who are you become who you are? If people can't see that in you, you need to question who you are. So Nicodemus, you cannot see the kingdom of God. You've been raised in religion all your life. You don't know anything different. It sounds like the people today, oh, I come from a Christian family. I'm a Christian. That's not how it works. Okay? So Nicodemus, you cannot see the kingdom of God by looking at miracles. All those signs we went through? Yeah, okay. okay. Nor can you enter the kingdom of God unless you are born again and are regenerated inside. 
It's the inside regeneration. So John 3, 9 through 10. <laughs> Here's Nicodemus. How can this be? <laughs> this is his response to talking with God. How can this be? Nicodemus, you are a teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? What's going on? <clears throat> then comes the indictment. You do not accept our testimony. We, in verse 11. He goes back to Nicodemus' we. Here's his we. We, in verse 11, means God the Father, God the Son, and all the followers. The we that counts. Not the we of your committee that's checking me out. But in 2b, verse 2, second part b, from a broken religion, verse 13a, is the authority upon which Jesus bases what he says. Somebody read verse 13a. What's it say? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven. Okay. Not giving him any authority? Then what's he said? And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That's where we're going to go next. So, for God, now listen to this. For God so loved the world, just go to 3.16 for a second. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. I told you that there are no more verses than just uh, John 23 and 31. <laughs> All right, you know that. Focus your attention on the word world. This is not universalism. Gary and I were talking the other day, and we actually went to the movies together. <laughs> and, uh, and, and we were laughing about some stuff, and, and uh, we were talking about this word world, the world, okay? Jesus clarifies for Nicodemus that world does not mean the children of Israel. That's what, Nicod that's what Nicodemus thinks. That's the world. Okay? The children of Israel. All of those in dispersion, we're all going to bring them back. Everything's going to be fine. You know? It does not mean the children. Nor does it mean some kind of universal salvation for everyone. Okay? Jew or Gentile. But the world that God loves and gives up his son for is the entire human race that has rebelled against God. That's what it means because of their fallen condition and have no way back to the relationship with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Consider a more Greek literary translation of this. I, I, what I did is I went to the original Greek and I thought, I wonder if that, I wonder if that explains the world better. <laughs> and I found three, three things that explains better. Watch this, listen to this. If it was translated directly, it would sound like this. <clears throat> For, this reason or whatever came before it, in this way God loved, that is, gave the world his son. The world. The heathen cosmos, including the earth. Okay? And so, he gave the unique son. That's what the word really means, unique son. The very best that he had. The very best. The only son. Okay. In order that all who believe in him might not be destroyed. Look up that word. Apollo. Killed. Annihilated. But have eternal life. That's not the way we think of that when we read it. Or God's a love the word. That's not how we do it. Okay? But that's what he's saying. How does uh, Jesus uh, bring about the new birth? I'm going to talk to you about this in two seconds. Here it is. It is the new birth that produces eternal life. That's it. That's the bottom line. John 3, 13 through 15. No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came out of heaven. That's his whole authority, the Son of Man. 
Just as Moses was lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. So Jesus assures Nicodemus that you must have a point of reference. And this was the problem. I know a lot of people who said to me, Boy, if I could just sit down and talk to <coughs> Jesus. Really? What would be your point of reference? Oh, you remember me? Yeah, I'm the old no good sinner, loser. You know, I'd like to talk to you about some heavenly thing. Huh? Huh? Nicodemus tried that. It didn't work. There's no point of reference. So Jesus finds it impossible. Since there's no reference, point of reference with Nicodemus, other than the Hebrew Bible that he tried really hard with him uh, to get him to, to see, to help him understand the mysteries of being born again. Nicodemus couldn't get it. He didn't understand in turn. Jesus went to Numbers 21, 6 through 9, and that's what, where this comes from, this whole statement of lift it up. You remember, that's the one about the snakes, right? In the Old Testament, where Moses uh, prayed for the people who got bitten by the snakes and uh, made a snake and put it up on a pole. And Jesus tells Nicodemus, just like that, I need to be lifted up on a pole and all need to come to me. And when they see me, they'll be saved. When they come to me. Jesus explains to Nicodemus that it is he that has to be held up lifted up his crucifixion in order for the people to have eternal life. Here's the conclusion. John closes by saying, Jesus came into the world as light, but men love darkness instead of the light because their deeds are evil. Now, when he uses evil here and he talks about deeds, you don't think of Nicodemus as an evil person. I mean, after all, I've had people say to me, hey, Prof, but well, what about the fact that Nicodemus got together with uh, 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 Joseph of Arimathea and they took him down from the cross and they put him in a nice tomb and they, they the, the, the Jews didn't embalm, so they, what they did is they put, you know, uh, lotions and, you know, all kinds of wonderful, good smelling stuff all over the body and wrapped him and put him in a tomb. Doesn't that say how much he loved him? No, it does not. No. Won't that get him into heaven? No, it does not. See? It's not about good works. I, know I definitely agree that it's not about good works, but mm -hmm. wouldn't that be like an indicator of the respect that he had for him? Yes, absolutely. And that's exactly what it is. What, 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 where, where Nicodemus came out here was, and I, I'm going to say this and then you'll, you'll catch it, uh, he came away from the conversation convinced at best that Jesus was a good, honorable man sent by God, perhaps as a prophet, but by no means the Messiah. He was not the Messiah. Being steeped in law, Nicodemus was sure that he was in the will of God and that Moses was the person who could be trusted. He also believed in the traditional Jewish concept of the Messiah, as someone like David or Joshua, a military leader that would come, conquer, and set up his kingdom where the Jews would be brought together and live under the reign of God. So whose who's summary of Nicodemus' findings is that? Mine. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> right, so. You can get... And you can read anything else that you want, yeah. and they'll basically, some say, oh, we just don't know how it all turned out. So Ten, I gave you Tenny, and Tenny says that. Tenny says, you know, I, it doesn't look good, I just don't know. I, I, I'm not sure how it all came out. But then you read D.A. Carson, Carson's very clear. Poor guy didn't make it. <laughs> and you read some others, you know. So is it customary for Jews who acknowledge mm -hmm. a prophet, mm -hmm. which did here. Mm -hmm. Rabbi, we know that you were a teacher who has come from God. Mm -hmm. That's that's basically a prophet. Mm -hmm. um, right. Is it customary for the Jews of old to kill their own prophet? Yes. In fact, they got, accused, they got accused in the synoptics of killing the prophets. Mm -hmm. Jesus got mm -hmm. in their face and said, you killed all the prophets we sent to you. Mm -hmm. 
Remember it? Yeah. yeah, it's customer. And that's basically what they do. They, they, they kill profits. That's, uh, they, and the thing that's interesting is what they prophesy is right in front of them. It's right there in the scripture. It's not like the prophet made it up. Jeremiah ran for his life. Because of why? He was scared. They were going to try to kill him. Yeah. Alright, now we have one, we have about 15 minutes, and, and uh, we have one other little thing I want to give to you, and then um, I just want you to, uh, and, and I can do this in 15 minutes, and then we'll talk about it next time. You're going to love this. What I did here is uh, I took, I took the, uh, the conversation between Jesus and the woman at the well. And I sketched it out for you. Now, now i got to tell you something. You, most of you know that um, I have a company. Basically, what we do is we publish books and whatever. This will eventually be published. So please don't, uh, don't put it out there like you did or something. You know? <laughs> uh, give it to somebody or some bastard because that's, that's what they do. Uh, all, all I want you to do is be aware of the fact that this information is extremely helpful, okay, that, so that you can understand the conversation. Now, to make a long story short, let me start at the end of this. At the end of this, what happens is, I'm going to tell you the story instead of reading it to you. Jesus is on his way to Bethany. <clears throat> this is back where he's leaving the trans -York. He's cutting through of Samaria. He comes to a town named Sakha, okay? And he goes to that town, and he's tired. He's pooped. Uh, they've been working, they've been walking, it's been a long time. He sends his disciples out to some place to get something to eat, and uh, he sits down by the well, and about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, which is not the time when women come to draw water, <laughs> uh, uh, a young woman comes uh, and is drawing water from the well. And he looks at her and he smiles, I'm sure, and says, uh, could I have a drink of water? And uh, unlike Cinderella, where uh, Cinderella uh, says to the fairy godmother that's posing like a, a poor uh, person, uh, sure, uh, I, I, could, I could get some milk for you or some buttermilk or give you something. This woman doesn't do it that way. <laughs> What she does is she's kind of startled, and she's surprised, and she's startled and surprised because of one thing. He's a Jew. Jews don't talk to Samaritans, and they certainly don't talk to women. Okay? Matter of fact, his disciples, when they came back, were, ooh, what are you doing, man? You know, you're going to get us in trouble. You know? So that, that, was, that was a disconcerting. So... Then there's kind of a claim that's made, if you see at the top page, the second one in there, there's a contact and there's a claim. And he talks about, if you knew who I was, you know, you would give me, ask of me, something from me, you know, um, and you would ask some water. Uh, but the challenge comes in 4, 11 through 12 with the woman at the bottom. Uh, this is Jacob's well, you know, and she talks to him about how it got there and, and why it's important. You, you see yourself more important than our father Jacob? <laughs> Interesting. And she challenges him that way. And uh, so Jesus does a little reaffirmation claim with her in 4.13-14. through 14. And what he does is he takes Jacob's water and Jesus' water that he's saying is everlasting. If you ask me for water, I would give you everlasting water. And of course the woman, she keeps it right on a physical relationship. And that is, how do I get that water? You know, if I could get that water, I wouldn't have to come here every day. <laughs> that would be really good. You mean there's a way that I can get water and I don't have to come to the well? You say, oh, she's missing the point. Well, yeah, kind of, but she's still on the physical plane. She's not, you know, she's wondering who this guy is, you know, that's saying this stuff to her, okay? And then, what happens? He compares the two. And after the comparison, there's a, oh, everything in blue is a literary law, or a contrast that you've learned in class. And then, um, 
what happens is uh, she talks um, about uh, the water and uh, a rapport and trust is established between the two of them. They get in a conversation, all the rest of it. And now, all of a sudden, this whole conversation takes a turn, a very interesting turn. And it takes a turn because Jesus says to her, uh, go get your husband and come on out here and, and let's talk. <laughs> And she kind of pauses, and then Jesus gives her credit for saying rightly, I don't have a husband. And he says, yes, that's right, you don't. Matter of fact, you've had five husbands, and the one that you're living with right now is not your husband. And what's her first words out of her mouth? What does she say? You're a prophet. You're a prophet. <laughs> this is the way they all go. They all go, you know, you're a prophet, you know, because you can tell me something about myself. She confesses to the fact that this is right. Then the conversation turns. We're no longer going to talk about a physical situation. Water that works, water that doesn't work. We're now going to talk about a spiritual situation. You know what I heard? I heard that you guys say that you have to worship in Jerusalem. But we worship on Mount Garrison. Okay? And she brings this up to Jesus. And what does Jesus say to her? The time is coming. And now is, because I'm here. What's going to happen? I worship here or there. Here or there, but how are you supposed to worship now? In spirit, in spirit. Where'd you just hear that? Where'd you just hear that? Jesus does the exact same thing with her that he does with Nicodemus. Now watch. Okay. The affirmation. Jesus answers the question about worship and where and all the rest of it. Then there's this expectation in 425 of her on the bottom, if you can see. The affirmation, I know that the Messiah is coming, and he will explain everything to us. What happens? The revelation, John 4.26, the law of climax, the whole conversation builds to this. I the one speaking to you. I am he. I am the Messiah. What's her reaction? You've got the kid. You're just a prophet. Right? Uh -uh. What's her reaction? What did she do? Do you remember the story? She leaves her jar and goes and tells her. Leaves the jar. She shook up. <laughs> She runs into town, and she tells everybody she can grab hold of. This guy told me everything I ever did. Because this sounds to me like this conversation went on a little bit longer. Okay, we don't know everything. Just what John gave us. Okay? Everything I ever did. And, 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 and could this be the Messiah? What kind of question is that? It's rhetorical, isn't it? Yeah. It's a rhetorical question. Of course it's the Messiah. This is the Messiah. And then what's the town do? They decide to go out and meet this guy. We've got to see this for ourselves. While they're doing that, the disciples are standing there, and Jesus is saying to the disciples, I don't know what you guys, but the fields are white with hearts. <laughs> There's lots of folks who are interested in what we're doing and what I'm all about. And we need to take advantage of that instead of modeling through life, trying to figure out what life's all about. Okay? So, what happens? All of a sudden, the town starts to come out. The disciples are seeing all these people. And Jesus ends up staying there how long? Two days. Yeah, two days. Huh? Two days. Two days. He stays there for two days. And he stays there two days. And what happens? What happens in this village? They believe. They believe. And why do they believe? Do they believe because 
of what the woman told him? They went to him. They came to him. They came to him. And they told her, we no longer believe because of what you told us. We believe because we have seen him ourselves. We've talked to him ourselves. And that's why we believe. Okay. Wow. What a contrast between her and Nicodemus. This woman's education was probably zilch. Jesus even had to remind her that in her life, and she was living in the middle of sin, Nicodemus was pure and pious. And, and he had to remind her, and, and he, like he tried to remind Nicodemus, that it's about water and the spirit, it's about being clean inside, it's about uh, confessing your sins, it's about recognizing who I am. And, and, and she just grabs hold of it and runs with it. And that day, not only did she believe, but many more believed. And when he came back through there again, what did he do in that area? He went back to that town to see how they were doing. And then he went on to the Passover, which I thought was interesting. He always returns for the sheep. Huh? Always returns for the sheep and sees how they're doing. That's the detail of this. Next time when we get together, we'll actually track it back and forth because there's some neat pieces of information inside here that I want you to see that will help you grow uh, and help you get a great relationship uh, with Christ. But here again, it's not a matter of, of just seeing a miracle. There's no great miracles here. It's a matter of accepting Christ for who he says he is. I'm going forward with that. And that's what changed this woman's whole life. And that's helpful. So I hope this is helpful to you. Does it make sense to you? Mm -hmm. Good? Okay. I want you to see the contrast here. Because here you've got this learned, brilliant man. Missed it. Over here you've got the simple person who, who had a difficult life and worked hard in life and, and all the rest of it. And got it and was brought into the kingdom. Almost like the blind man who now saw the light. He was brought into the kingdom. Okay, somebody pray for us and uh, remember. Uh, Patrick couldn't come today. He had to visit some book books that are important. There's a couple others that couldn't be here. Uh, pray for them. Keep them in your mind as we think about them. Think about your friends. I've tried to give you a lot of good information to help you witness and to help you share with your friends. And I hope that you will understand this. If you ever have questions about these things, call me. Talk to me. I'll be willing to help you so that you can help someone else. And that's the important thing about it. If you're called like you say you are, you have already risen from the dead. You're alive in Christ. And you have all the advantages and the blessings of that in your life. And it's always good to share that with someone. You know, you see how it goes. All right? Somebody read us in prayer. Sure. Lord, we thank you for this day that you have given us to consider uh, the work that you did on this earth when you were here, Lord, that paved the way for everything that we can enjoy now. Lord, we think on these instances, God, where you, you reached out, you, you were deliberate and intentional with people, and you met them where they were, and you challenged the things in their lives that needed to be challenged, Lord. And as we reflect on <clears throat> uh, just the many barriers that could be in the way of us or others coming to you, even now, as we are your sheep, Lord, we, we pray that you would give us humility as we consider that there's nothing that we can just know intellectually that will bring us into a closer relationship with you, God, that it's about the work that you're doing, and it's about us being conformed to your image because of what you've done on the cross. And so I pray that you would humble us as we consider these things, that you would excite us by them, Lord, that you would equip us to, to share this truth in this life and help us to be people who can point others to you and say, come see a man who told me all I ever did, Lord. So we 
ask for that opportunity. Make us faithful with those things, and we commit our ways to you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you very much. Have a great week. Awesome. And happy Easter. Yeah.